from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour. Facebook earnings are out and the social network warns growth could slow this year, especially when it comes to revenue. User numbers are in line, but investors want more. Shares are falling. Plus, Tim Cook and Elon Musk say the chip shortage may slow their companies down over the next few months, but it doesn't seem to be slowing down AMD. I'll talk to AMD CEO Lisa Hsu about how the chip maker is bucking the trend, taking on Intel, and her outlook for when chip supply catches up to demand. And the social network for professionals, LinkedIn, predicts the great reshuffle with massive changes in the post-pandemic workforce underway. CEO Ryan Roslansky joins us one year into the job. We'll get to all of that, but first let's take a look at the markets as investors continue to digest these new CDC guidelines. Google postponing its return to work, mandating vaccines for employees along with Facebook. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta taking a look at the markets across the board. Kriti, how are investors responding? Absolutely, Emily. With that background of the virus and what that means for a lot of corporations, it puts the spotlight on the Fed. And today's trading session was all about positioning for that potentially kind of risk-off move. And that's what you saw when it came to tech stocks. The S&P 500 closing about flat on the day, but it was really that tech outperformance you can see in the NASDAQ. Of course, some of that came of course from those mega tech companies, thanks to last night's pretty stellar earnings and, of course, positioning ahead of those Facebook earnings after the bell today. So you did see some of that going, some of that money, I should say, going into mega tech, but there's also a China story here. We know that in the last couple of sessions, a 20% drop for Chinese stocks on those regulatory scrutiny concerns until Emily last night when overnight in Asia, you started to see Chinese officials reach out to some of these banks and say, well, hold on a second. That scrutiny, that uh, push to move education stocks into nonprofits, well, that's really only an education story. It's not meant to hinder kind of the uh, broader tech bid. And when we're talking about the broader tech bid, it's important to keep in mind what's going on with those subsectors because at the end of the day it is one big tech trade and you can see that here with the semiconductors in orange and then the biotech index in white trading higher and trading together Emily that's the macro picture Ed let's get to the micro yeah tech earnings in full swing and Facebook falling in after hours it beat on advertising revenue and profit user growth pretty flat but it had a warning for investors that there will be headwinds ad targeting headwinds throughout 2021 from regulatory and platform changes spoiler alert it's the Apple iOS change that they're talking about. Qualcomm as well, the world's biggest smartphone chip maker. Pretty good quarter, relatively good numbers. Talking about robust demand for handsets, 5G driven, a good quarter for them. And similar themes actually in regular trade on Wednesday. Look at some of the names that already reported this week. For example, Google, robust rebound in its advertising business. Consumers using search for travel, for retail, things like that. Apple falling after warning that growth would slow down after a robust quarter where 5G drove handset sales. Best performing stock on the S&P 500 and the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, AMD. Such good earnings in the quarter and such a bullish forecast for four-year sales that one Susquehanna analyst, Emily, said these earnings were, quote, amazing. A lot of superlatives out there, Ed, to describe AMD's quarter. Thanks so much. I want to stick with AMD, the chip maker, maker as Ed said, giving a bullish third quarter sales forecast, indicating it's gaining share from Intel in the lucrative market for server chips. Second quarter revenue almost doubling to $3.85 billion. And analysts using words like flawless, superior, amazing, as Ed said, to describe the quarter. AMD CEO Lisa Sue joins us now from their offices in Austin, Texas. Lisa, it doesn't get much better than that. And coming into this quarter, there was a lot of concern about whether the chip shortage would hold you back, and yet you're posting 99% revenue growth here. How are you navigating what seems to be a really tough situation better than almost anyone else? Well, hey, Emily, it's great to be here with you. Um, you know, I always uh, love spending some time with you guys. Um, I will say it was a very strong second quarter for us. Uh, we were excited with the momentum that we saw. You know, we're in an environment where um, the demand is very high for, um, you know, the products um, that we're building and customers are preferring our product. Uh, we've worked hard on the supply chain. There's no question there's a lot of work to do in the supply chain for semiconductors. And we're happy that we were able to exceed our uh, second quarter guidance as well as 
you know, guide up uh, for the rest of the year. So, you know, we now expect to be up 60% year on year. So um, it's just, you know, a very, uh, very strong business environment across our businesses. Now, AMD is getting stronger at a time when some say demand is going to start to peter out. What's your take on how much fundamental demand there is and how long the surge that we've been seeing really lasts? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, the way I like to say, um, Emily, is there's really, you know, two components. I mean, one is just um, we need more computing, you know, whether you're talking about, um, you know, the PC market, or you're talking about the data center market or the cloud market, I think we need more computing. And um, that's like an overarching uh, principle. On top of that, um, I think, you know, AMD, you know, we currently have just very, very competitive products. I think we're showing, you know, leadership in a number of market segments. And that means customers are uh, really demanding our products and, and, and that's, that's great for overall business. So um, I would say that the market uh, continues to be strong and we continue to believe that um, the demand um, environment is strong. And on top of that, uh, you know, we have a very strong, you know, customer preference for um, our products. So, you know, we're excited about that environment and we continue to work closely with our customers to uh, keep, uh, keep tabs on how the demand environment shapes up. You have sounded a bit more conservative than others on Outlook for PCs, which I know is one of your key markets. I did talk to Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger last week, and he's bullish. What do you see when it comes to PCs? Well, let me say, I think the PC market has had just um, a tremendous last um, you know, four or five quarters. I mean, 2020 was very strong for the PC market. Um, 2021 is very strong for the PC market. And so um, I think that's good. You know, that's all the work from home, school from home. Now we have return to office. People are looking um, for more uh, PCs. Um, but we also see that as we go into the second half of the year, um, you know, we do see there are some constraints in the overall supply chain. So not necessarily of AMD processors, um, but more of, you know, let's call it some of the other components that you need in the PC market. And so we just want to make sure that we take that into account um, as we form forecast uh, for the second half of the year. But, you know, look, we, we see growth as we go into the third quarter and as we go into the fourth quarter. Um, we're now growing overall 60 percent uh, year on year. And that's even with, let's call it, um, you know, perhaps a little bit of a conservative look at PCs going from the first half to the second half. Um, that means a lot of pieces of the other pieces of our business are growing. Our data center is growing. Um, our gaming business is also growing. And so that's the nice thing about having a portfolio like we do. I was going to go to data centers next. Investors are really concerned about this lucrative server chip market, how much share, how much more share you can grab there. How much more room is there to grow? Well, uh, the data center market is our strategic big bet, Emily. You know, we've talked about that before. Um, it's been a uh, multi-year, multi-generational journey. Um, we're excited. You know, in the earlier this year, we launched our third generation Epic product. Um, it's code named Milan. Um, it's just a fantastic product. Uh, we saw great adoption uh, here in the second quarter with um, a lot of uh, you know cloud folks um, you know really adopting uh, Milan very quickly. As we go into the second half of the year, we see um, enterprise also picking up um, you know uh, Milan. And again, you know the way we look at this is it is a multi generational uh, journey, and uh, we've made great progress uh, this year with our overall um, you know data center business, and we expect it to be a growth driver for us as we go into 2022 and beyond as well. And yet we're seeing the in-house efforts of companies like AWS ramping up to design their own chips. Does that cap what's possible there for you? You know, I, I really don't think so, Emily. I mean, I think what you're seeing is that, um, you know, the entire infrastructure data center, you know, market is realizing just how important compute is. And when I say that, that's compute in the big sense of compute. And so you have a lot of different applications and a lot of different workloads, but, you know, we specialize in processors and, you know, we have, uh, you know, thousands of engineers that are looking, you know, um, you know, every day at how we continue to push the envelope on computing. Um, our roadmap is very exciting. You know, as I said, we just launched um, our third generation um, Epic, uh, you know, Milan generation. You know, we like Italian cities as our uh, product code names. And so, um, you know, next year we're launching our Genoa, the next generation family of um, in five nanometer. And we're going to go, you know, we have a long roadmap beyond that. So I really look at it as an opportunity to partner uh, with the largest um, data center customers in the world and ensure that, you know, we're actually building a big, big ecosystem to satisfy all of this compute um, that is needed, you know, throughout the industry. 
Meantime, you know, your competition is in part Intel, and there is a new-ish CEO there who claims he is fighting for every single order. Many of your predecessors enjoyed these fleeting periods of success, but then struggled to keep up with Intel's scale. Um, how do you avoid that fate? Investors seem to believe you will, uh, but I know that you're thinking about it. Well, Emily, it's a very competitive market, and we always think of it as a very competitive market. But, you know, given that's being the case, you know, we believe in playing our game and playing the long game. So our game is about um, pushing the envelope on technology, uh, executing generation after generation, making sure our customers trust and love um, our products and really adopt our products across their portfolio. Uh, we think that we're doing that well, but you know we're still underrepresented um, in the market. So we think that there's uh, plenty of growth room as we um, you know exit 2021 and go into uh, 2022 and beyond. And you can count on the fact that you know at AMD we're pretty competitive as well. So um, I think we want to be aggressive and make sure that we are satisfying um, what the customers need in the go forward plans. All right. Uh, meantime, Apple and Tesla, speaking of the broader shortage, they're warning that the chip shortage is potentially going to slow them down over the next few months. When you and I last talked, you explained that this is a really diverse market. There are all different kinds of chips. Which kinds of chips do you see rebounding faster than others? And how does that impact various industries, whether it is mobile phones or cars? Yeah, I think it's a, a, a good question, Emily. And you know, I, I always like to start with the context. And the context is that the demand environment is just very strong, you know, up, above what any of us would have forecasted if you asked us six or 12 months ago. And so the entire industry has been working on, you know, just meeting um, that very strong demand. And I think we've made good progress. So I think in different parts of, you know, different subsegments, you may see different constraints. Um, right now, there seem to be some constraints on let's call it components. So not necessarily the main processors, um, but um, other things like, you know, other integrated circuits that you need. And I know that um, there's progress being made and it will continue to get better. I think second half of this year is still, um, you know, quite tight, but we're working closely with all of our supply chain partners um, to uh, unlock more uh, supply capability, and then it'll get better as we go into 2022, um, you know, for sure. Meantime, the pandemic seems to still be giving us uncertainty ahead. Lots of concerns about the Delta variant. Apple and Google are pushing back their return to work. Google and Facebook are mandating vaccines for employees. We just saw a spike in cases in Texas where you are. How are you thinking about the return to work given uh, this evolving situation? And what does this mean for business in general, given the tumult that we've seen and that you have weathered over the last year? Yeah, so I would say, uh, you know, first and foremost, and I know this is true for all of my, uh, my peers as well, um, our employee safety is the number one priority. And we've shown the ability to work um, in a remote environment and just, you know, execute uh, phenomenal results. And so I think we know how to do that. Um, that being the case, um, I'm looking forward uh, to being able to do more uh, in person, and I think we need to do that, you know, very carefully and within all of the CDC guidelines and the other guidelines. Uh, we are, of course, encouraging our employees to get, um, you know, vaccinated as well. And, um, you know, I look at this as a process. So uh, we are navigating it. We've navigated it for 15 months. Um, you know, we're all looking forward to, uh, to a time when this is less of a concern. But right now, it's about employee safety and employee flexibility all while still executing, you know, just a, a very aggressive roadmap. All right, Lisa Su, CEO of AMD, thanks so much for joining us. Good to have you here today on the show. Meantime, Qualcomm out with earnings, delivering also a bullish quarterly forecast. The world's largest smartphone chip maker being boosted by the growth of 5G, increasing consumer demand for new devices. CEO Cristiano Amman saying the company is also trying to expand its reach beyond the phone chip market and win orders in PCs, cars, and home electronics. We spoke to him right before the earnings call, and he said he's also optimistic about the chip crunch. We expect material improvement in supply by the end of the year. And um, as I said before, we're, st we're still seeing more demand right. than supply across our business, but things are continue to improve on the supply side, consistent with what we said, and that's reflected in our guide. All right, coming up, Facebook shares plummeting as the social network warns revenue growth will slow significantly. We're gonna tell you why next. This is Bloomberg.
Facebook facing major headwinds under the weight of Apple's new ad targeting software. The social network warning that revenue growth will decelerate significantly. This after reporting $29.1 billion in revenue for the second quarter with user growth coming in in line. But after massive big tech beats, investors seem to be wanting more. Joining us now, Scott Kessler, global head of technology at Third Bridge. Scott, uh, got to talk about the, the revenue growth warnings here that it could decelerate significantly in part due to this new Apple ad tracking software. Users just aren't opting in, which is not a surprise. What's your take here? Yeah, so thanks a lot, Emily. Um, I guess a couple of things. Look, IDFA from Apple, um, it, it's interesting because the social media companies that reported results last week notably indicated that IDFA didn't have a negative impact on results and they didn't really indicate that they thought it would. Um, so. To some extent, sure, this may influence Facebook, but I also think that Facebook uh, has some difficult comparisons in the back half of the year. Uh, perhaps this is just them being reasonable and conservative in terms of the guidance they're providing. Uh, what's your focus on user growth? I mean, obviously Facebook is now this family of products, the Blue app, there's Instagram, there's WhatsApp. Are you at all concerned that as people return to work that you know we're spending less time on our devices, we're spending less time social networking? Yeah, for sure. I think that's going to be an influence on what goes on uh, with Facebook and, frankly, the other social media companies. Um, we saw 7% growth in DAU and MAU. Look, it's significant deceleration from the 12% we saw from each of those uh, in the year ago period. That's not surprising because, of course, we saw so much uptake and engagement last year when everyone was at home. Uh, that being said, I think this is really now a story about uh, the rate at which pricing can increase, that was probably the single biggest contributor to revenue growth uh, in the second quarter. And I'm just not so sure that they're going to have the favorable comparisons uh, as well as, uh, I'd say, kind of the pricing tailwinds uh, to maintain that momentum. That's why we're seeing the guidance uh, where it is. And that's frankly why I think the street was already below 20 percent revenue growth uh, for next year and the out year as well. We're listening in to the earnings call on Mark Zuckerberg talking about AI, talking about new tools they're giving to creators. Let's take a quick listen in to what he's been saying. Now, people like to watch videos recommended by our personalized algorithm. So this gives creators a good way to reach new people who don't follow them yet. And this is also a good complement to our social feeds. And it's an area where our progress in AI uh, is going to make the experience a lot better in the coming months and years. Meantime, Scotty has been talking up the metaverse, which is this idea that there is a future internet we will be in rather than on. And you know, I wonder if this is something that Zuckerberg is chasing because he knows that you know, sort of uh, traditional activity on social platforms isn't necessarily going to last as technology is changing so quickly around all of us. You know, how do you think about that when you think of the future of Facebook and how big a threat is it? Well, look, um, I think it's fair to say that the company is looking for other growth drivers, right? I mean, a big pivot to e-commerce, understandably, last year. They've been talking about AI for a long time. I feel like Oculus was acquired about seven years ago. And it's not, I think, unthinkable to suggest that other social media companies are actually doing um, AR and VR better than Facebook. So understandably, it's a priority. Uh, I think a lot of people want to see that in the product and driving um, operational and maybe financial benefits to come. All right. Well, we're going to continue to follow along with the call. Scott Kessler of Third Bridge, always good to have your input here. Thanks so much for stopping by. We still have plenty more tech results this week. Amazon, T-Mobile, Pinterest, all out with their results Thursday. And of course, we're going to bring you all the details, but next, she is the powerhouse behind hit shows Grey's Anatomy and Bridgerton. After the break, we're going to hear from Hollywood heavyweight Shonda Rhimes. Stay tuned. This is Bloomberg. More than 100 protesters gathered outside Activision Blizzard offices in Southern California to protest the video game maker's handling of a sexual harassment lawsuit. They were joined virtually by fans who called for a boycott of the company's games in solidarity with employees. The lawsuit filed last week also details a workplace culture in which women face unequal pay and 
retaliation. In response to news of the walkout, CEO Bobby Kotick sent a letter to staff calling the company's recent actions, quote, tone deaf and promised swift action to stamp out harassment. Well, for nearly two decades, Shonda Rhimes has been one of the most important entertainers in Hollywood. She made her mark, of course, with Grey's Anatomy, a show that is still going strong after 16 years. And the hits keep coming for Rhimes after she shined a multi-year deal with Netflix and Bridgerton became a pandemic binge-watching favorite. Peer-to-peer -peer host David Rubenstein caught up with Shonda Rhimes to talk about her success, but also the challenges she's faced in her career. I just found that to be a difficult question to answer. And I say that because um, I don't know what it feels like to be a white man. So I don't know how people were treating the white men at the time. I only know how I'd always been treated. And I was, you know, raised very clearly by my parents to be a person who did not look at things as obstacles. I looked at things as hills to climb. And when anybody treated me in a way that was not 100% respectful. I was taught that that was always their problem and that they needed to be put in their place and that I should move forward. And so I'm sure that I experienced a lot of things that were not probably what other people experienced. I just chose not to be defeated by them or, or even bother. Yeah. Some of them I probably didn't even bother to notice. So today, uh, given how prominent you are in the entertainment world, do you feel discrimination at any point now or do you don't feel any discrimination? Um, no, I mean, I'm. There is an ins, there's an insularity that comes with you know being in a certain position in Hollywood, but that doesn't change the fact that, you know, if somebody doesn't know who you are, they still see you as you know just another person of color. You know, person of color. The racism in this country is the racism in this country. You can watch more of that interview with Shonda Land CEO Shonda Rhimes herself on the David Rubenstein Show at the following times. Take a look there. All right, up next, I'll be speaking with Ryan Roslansky, the CEO of LinkedIn, as it tops $10 billion in annual revenue for the first time. His insights on the future of work and the challenges leading the company through the pandemic. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. One of the highlights of Microsoft's latest earning re release was LinkedIn, which Microsoft acquired back in 2016. Its annual revenue surpassed $10 billion for the first time, up 27% from the previous year, amidst, of course, a very tumultuous year for the workforce. Joining us now here in the studio, LinkedIn CEO Ryan Roslansky on your one-year anniversary as the CEO of LinkedIn. Congratulations and good to have you. You took over as CEO, I guess you'd been working there for more than a decade, but in the middle of a pandemic, when not only were you dealing with a lot of transition internally, but the entire workforce, the whole platform was going through a transition. What was that like to navigate? Yeah, um, I mean, if I went back a year ago, by no means did I think that I'd be starting this role uh, from my bedroom <laughs> with my kids doing schoolwork around the house, uh, trying to navigate the company through a global pandemic. So it was definitely... Uh, it was challenging. It was a challenging year, though, for everyone uh, across the world. And, you know, you don't get to choose to be a CEO only when the sun is shining. You can't be a leader only when things are good. And more than anything, I'm really proud of how our company came together. Uh, we're at a place now where we're, over 6,000 people are getting a job on LinkedIn every day. We helped train 42 million people on the platform last year to navigate the pandemic, resulting in what we just announced yesterday, which is uh, for our first time in history, $10 billion in revenue for the year for the company, which I'm very proud of. Not too shabby. You're also talking about the great reshuffle, this post-pandemic uh, change underfoot in the workforce. And I'm curious um, what the changes are that you see. You say hiring is back above pre-pandemic levels. Yeah, I mean, if you take a step back, and by virtue of us being LinkedIn and seeing professional conversations happening uh, across the globe, one thing we're seeing by far is that every company right now, every CEO, every leadership team is having to rethink what their company means, how they work, where they work, are they hybrid, are they remote? Fundamentally, they're rethinking their entire cultures and their entire values as a company. On the other hand, every employee in the world that's worked remotely for the past 18 months is trying to figure out for themselves not only how they work, but where they work and why they work. 
So we're seeing this just change in people understanding what they value in work. And that's creating what we're calling this great reshuffle. People are trying to figure out where they want to work, how they want to work moving forward. And I think that over the next 18 months, you're going to see uh, a lot of you know, uncertainty and a lot of confusion going on. But my guess is that over time, it all kind of shuffles out in the right spot where employees and uh, companies are coming together where they share their values and the way that they want to work. This ends up being a very positive thing for the workforce years out. Apple and Google just pushed back their return to work. Google and Facebook now mandating vaccines for employees. There's a lot of controversy about how companies are managing this shift. And I wonder if it could also, for some companies, if they don't get it right, could it lead to a great exodus of talent? Yeah, and like, like I said, I think all these decisions that companies are making, and by the way, uh, they're not easy decisions. None of us have ever gone through them before. Uh, but they're really related to how we want our companies to work and our culture and values. And right now, employees are able to vote. And with their kind of idea of where they want to work, it's very easy to move around roles right now. And they're going to align with the companies that share their values. Now, um how are you thinking about return to work? I know Microsoft's policy and LinkedIn is an independent company, but vaccines, for example, will you require that employees have them? Yeah, you know, it's fascinating. I just saw uh, Google's news right before I, I came in. And, you know, the way a lot of this works is there's so much uncertainty and we, you know, we watch what other companies are doing and we all kind of learn along the way. Having a growth mindset is the key to, to all of this. Uh, for us, we've been embracing flexibility is the, is the core tenet of what we care about. Uh, we rely on our principles and most importantly, we rely on our culture. We trust each other to get our jobs done where it works best for us. And that's kind of key to what we do at LinkedIn. So does that mean you're thinking about the vaccine issue or... I, I think we're always open to kind of better understanding what works best for us. And, and I, I don't know what that means long term for LinkedIn. My guess is uh, we're all going to keep learning. And, you know, watching Google's news today, my, my thought is that, you know, the more that we give employees choice about where they work, things like requiring vaccines to come into the office, as long as employees have a choice to work from home, that'll probably be an okay thing longer term. When you're requiring someone to have a vaccine and come into the office, uh, that could be more trickier for companies. Now, you've been owned by Microsoft now for five years, $10 billion in revenue. I'll never forget the morning that I got a, woken up to interview Satya Nadella and Jeff Wiener in about an hour, the, the news of the deal that nobody seemed to see coming. How has being Microsoft, being part of Microsoft changed the company? I think it's been one of the most positive experiences of the company uh, by far. You know, when, when Microsoft acquired the company, Satya's vision and Jeff at the time, you know, they kind of sat down and said, this is a deal about growing LinkedIn, period. And by being part of the Microsoft ecosystem, how can we help to grow LinkedIn, but keep LinkedIn as an independent standalone company? You take a look now, five years later, I mean, revenue's nearly tripled since that acquisition. Uh, we're growing faster and accelerating off a larger base now. So I think that that thesis that they started with five years ago is really playing out. And for me, it's just such a pleasure and honor to be part of that leadership team and to watch people like Satya or Amy Hood or Brad Smith, I mean, best in the business to learn from and to help you know, move LinkedIn and the company forward. You did have some layoffs last year. I saw that was maybe, maybe that was like one of your first memos that you unfortunately had to write in the talent solutions business because people weren't hiring, right? Um, it, are those kind of structural changes behind LinkedIn? What does the growth story for the company look like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, LinkedIn is an 18-year-old company, and last year around this time, we saw an opportunity for what we needed to do to move the company forward, and we, and we made those changes. Right now, when you see this great reshuffle happening, when you see every company and every CEO and every employee trying to navigate the future of what work looks like for them, they're all turning to LinkedIn to figure that out. And I think that's a really valuable place for us to be in terms of how people find the skills they need, the roles they need, the opportunities they need to navigate this. So uh, across all our business lines, this further engagement, people coming and turning to LinkedIn is only lifting all boats across the company. And I know you're historically a product guy. You've been at the company for 12 years. Um, LinkedIn has, you know, some people have complained about spam and that the product isn't as slick as it used to be. How are you thinking about that? I think across our, you know, 774 million members have joined LinkedIn. We have about three members that are joining per second. Uh, engagement is an all-time high. People are connecting more than ever. They're learning skills more than ever. They're finding opportunities more than ever. Uh, and it's, you know, our job as a product organization, as a company, to just keep ensuring that we can connect that talent opportunity uh, as much as we can through the product. We're also seeing, you know, out of our membership, 125 million members now are our first-line workers. It's the segment that's growing. 35% of all signups right now are first-line workers, and they're more engaged than even the knowledge workers. So we're starting to expand even beyond our core uh, globally right now. 
And LinkedIn had made some progress in China, which was one, mar one, pla one market where, where we thought that maybe a, a U.S. tech company would succeed. What are you actually seeing there now, given the, the crackdown and you know, c challenges for company, Chinese companies yeah. uh, that they're having? I mean, I think just taking a step back in general, one of the things that I've learned in this role are the number of constituents that you have to manage as the CEO. And more and more governments are becoming an important constituent to, uh, to work with, be it how we work to create economic opportunity in China. Uh, last week, I actually sat down for lunch with uh, Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez. I know you talked to him as well. They came to us trying to you know, figure out how to help you know, uh, grow technology in Spain, turning to LinkedIn for uh, help with skills data and opportunity data. Met uh, two weeks ago with uh, former Secretary John Kerry, who's now the special envoy to President Biden on climate. Uh, fundamentally, climate change is, is going to be about a human capital problem to help ensure that people have the skills they need for companies to move forward. So working with governments is becoming much more part of the job than it ever has. And I think that's OK, because they all share broad and prosperity and turning to LinkedIn to help them. Can you work with China? We have, and we will continue <laughs> to, yes. So what does the jobs picture look like then next year, this time? A lot of uncertainty ahead. But a year from now, what do you see? You know, my guess is that we'll continue to see uh, for probably 18 months uh, the idea of companies really trying to understand what their culture and values are, what companies mean for them, what their business model looks like moving forward. At the same time, employees trying to understand what they value. We'll see a lot of reshuffling. We'll continue to see hiring at, at, at large pace. But ultimately, my guess is that this all settles down into the right place probably 18 months from now. All right. LinkedIn CEO Ryan Roslensky, congratulations on your one year anniversary. Um, appreciate you stopping by and coming here in the studio in person. Hopefully we get to do this more. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Meantime, Spotify added fewer users than expected this quarter. The audio streaming giant blaming the pandemic for its second straight quarter of sluggish growth shares down almost 25% so far this year. So why aren't as many people signing up? Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw joins us now to discuss. Lucas, what's happening here? No, there were two factors that Spotify blamed. One was the, the ongoing pandemic, especially in the countries that it calls sort of the rest of the world. That's not the US or Western Europe. It's especially in Africa and Asia, places that are still newer for Spotify. So for example, in India, where the pandemic has, has obviously been pretty brutal, Spotify delayed or, or postponed a marketing campaign that it thought would have been helpful in signing some customers up. Uh, it also talked about sort of some fluky thing that happened with a third party distributor where people who had problems signing up for Spotify, the company didn't specify what that third party was, but it said it, it did impact growth. Kind of strange in the quarter because Spotify's new subscriber growth in terms of actual paying customers was quite good. It just didn't sign up as many of those free customers in some of those newer markets. What does this mean for the broader, you know, whether it's Apple Music or, you know, some of the other competitors in this space that had seen, you know, such epic, if you will, pandemic growth? You know, I think long term, it still feels like Spotify is on solid ground. I mean, it's going to hit 400 million users by the end of this year. The amount of time that people are spending listening to music and podcasting on the service continues to go up. But we are in this sort of weird moment, I, I think, with a lot of subscription media services and, and, and media services in general, where the growth is a little lumpier than it has been. They got used to very consistent, strong growth. And whether you're looking at Netflix or you're looking at a Spotify, some of the growth they're posting right now is not quite the same. And I, I'm not, actually not sure how much we're supposed to extrapolate from that. Is this a sign that a service that already has so many customers like Spotify is starting to slow down and entering a new phase? Or is it a sign that they really did just add a lot of customers last year and so it's going to be a little bit slower? I'm not sure. And frankly, I'm not sure the executives at Spotify know either. So what's next? What are you following? You know, they're going to keep investing in podcasting and in new markets for the most part. You know, they have yet to hire a new head of their podcasting studios at the company. It's been a position that's now been open for a couple of months that they're looking to fill. Uh, they're going to use those to develop more and more original podcasts, which they hope will boost the ad business. One of the few bright spots in the quarter was that their ad business has grown more than 100% year over year. And they're going to hope that not only by creating new podcasts in the U.S. or li licensing new podcasts like Call Her Daddy, but they'll also do that abroad and use that to facilitate growth, whether it's in India, Southeast Asia. You know, Spotify has a pretty diverse kind of user base right now, but they'd like in particular to boost the number of subscribers in places that aren't the U.S. or Western Europe. All right. Lucas Shaw for us in L.A. Thanks so much, Lucas, for your insight there.
All right, coming up in our City Lab segment, I'm going to talk to the founder and CEO of Carbon Health, his insight on the Delta variant, vaccine distribution, and how to provide affordable health care in the United States when we need it most. That is next. This is Bloomberg. It's certainly not the direction that we want to be going. It, it's, it's very simple what needs to be done, which is every American needs to be vaccinated. This is now a disease of the unvaccinated. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo there speaking on Bloomberg earlier. Her sentiments shared by tech giant Google, the search engine giant announcing that all returning workers must be vaccinated. Facebook doing that as well. Uh, Google has also delayed its return to the office. CEO Sundar Pichai telling staff in an email because of the rise in Delta variant cases, employees will now return starting mid-October instead of September. Meantime, Apple is expected to reinstate a mask requirement at most of its U.S. retail stores for both customers and staff, even for those who are vaccinated. Although the iPhone maker isn't making it mandatory for retail staff to be vaccinated, it is strongly urging them to do so. And the pandemic, of course, has been the test of a lifetime for doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals on the front lines. Joining us now for today's City Lab segment is Aaron Bali, founder and CEO of Carbon Health, which has 80 medical clinics in 12 states across the United States and an interesting view into COVID. Um, so, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Talk to us about what trends you're seeing when it comes to testing, when it comes to vaccines, as we confront this really dangerous and scary Delta variant. So thank you for having me, Emily. Uh, unfortunately, we are seeing um, very high COVID positive rates after, uh, after a time frame where it was feeling like we had controlled it. Uh, so um, uh, with Delta variants, um, um, but the, the overall positive rate is high, but what we are seeing is among the vaccinated uh, adults, uh, there are some breakthrough cases, but it's fairly small compared to the rest of the compared to the rest of the population. Um, and I think the, we are, we also are seeing a lot uh, less severe symptoms among them. So I think that I would still echo the same same guidance. Let's let's get as many people as possible vaccinated. And Carbon Health has been in both in the front lines of the pandemic. We have finished 1.5 million vaccines, a vaccine administration, and. And we are hoping that uh, the remaining population will also see, uh, see the need for do the same. Are you seeing anything specifically regarding the latest surge? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you see vaccines slowing down? Do you see tests, positive test results clicking up? So the positive test, test results are really uh, just growing very fast right now. Um, and actually one of the, uh, the patterns you are seeing is uh, Delta variant, uh, like it becomes transmissive a lot faster. Uh, so which means even if you have some antibodies, uh, people are still like showing positive, positive tests. Uh, but again, if they're vaccinated, we are not seeing uh, a lot of kind of concerning symptoms among them. Now, you grew up in a small village in Turkey, and I know that your upbringing is in part what inspired the vision to start Carbon Health and make healthcare more accessible. What is the vision and how close are you to getting to where you want to be? So our vision, our, our mission has always been making um, like high quality healthcare accessible to everyone. When I came to this country as an immigrant, I was pleasantly surprised with how good the healthcare experience was, but only for the high income people, only for the wealthy. And you, if you look at the healthcare experience of an average American, it is actually, it's arguably worse than a lot of even developing countries like Turkey. So, uh, and we, and I think I thought the technology companies were not doing enough to really help average, average Americans healthcare problems. And we started Carbon Health on the first day with an obsession to making care better, better for average Americans. And what we have achieved is we now have, a, have a, the sort of experience that if someone who's in the top 1% is still considering as a really high quality to consumer experience, but then in a way it is accessible to people living paycheck to paycheck. 
So the main goal of the company is growing, the, um, becoming the first nationwide primary care provider. We have recently closed $350 million in financing, as you guys uh, first, I, I think, uh, shared. Uh, so we'll just grow that. And the other thing we are working on is doubling down on this concept that we call omni-channel healthcare. We have had clinics, we have had telemedicine providers, we have had uh, consumer devices and more, but nobody has really integrated these different modalities in a way that truly reduces patient friction. That is the core okay. product regional carbon that we have been investing in. All right, and you just raised another $350 million to help build that vision out. Aaron Bali, Carbon Health founder and CEO, thanks so much for joining us. Coming up, the company behind the app that fueled the meme stock Fremzy gets set for its trading debut. We're going to have all the details on Robinhood hitting the public markets next. This is Bloomberg. Trading app Robinhood set to make its own trading debut on Thursday. Sources telling Bloomberg that the company is seeing demand from investors to buy stock in the IPO within the marketed range at this point. That's $38 to $42 per share. The company not planning to price the offering above that. At this point, we've got a lot to unpack with this story. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Katie Roof, who's been working to uh, try to get the scoop. Uh, what exactly <laughs> do we know? at this point. So at this moment in time, Robinhood has a meeting at, to decide what the price is going to be. The bankers and the board and the lawyers are all discussing as we speak what it should price at. The latest we've heard is that it will be probably within the proposed range of 38 to 42 dollars, but not above the range. Um, you know, sometimes when there's a lot of excitement around a particular stock, they'll, they'll go above range. But so far, we're hearing it's within the range. And this would give Robinhood at the top of the range, what, like a $35 billion market cap? Yeah, so up to $35 billion if it goes to the top of the range. Of course, if it's at the bottom, it could be a few billion dollars lower. Uh, so they're deciding that right now. Of course, they're also trying to factor in a pop. Usually that's what uh, people want on the first day of trading is for their to be a pop to show some excitement for, from um, Wall Street. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. But certainly, you know, right now um, they're figuring out the, the formula. One thing that some people were disappointed about was that they didn't do a new range. Sometimes you'll see this with um, IPOs, especially the big IPOs. They'll do a range, and then if the roadshow goes well, they'll issue a new filing, an updated range. And Robinhood didn't do that, and, and they're not pricing above range either. Mm -hmm. So probably not the best sign for how the roadshow went. Hmm. Now, I, I, I'm wondering how investors are feeling about Robinhood in general, um, given that, you know, obviously they set aside a huge chunk for their own users. Um, there could be a lot of retail interest. And you wonder if Robinhood be, could become the target of its own customer base, for better or for worse. Sure, yeah. So there's a lot of mixed sentiment amongst its own customer base. Obviously, Robin has, has a lot of traders who um, have helped fuel a lot of this excitement in, in tech stocks and meme stocks in the past year, but a lot of them kind of turned on Robinhood after the GameStop frenzy where Robinhood controversially like suspended trading for a little bit on GameStop. And so um, some of them, you know, whenever I do a story, there's people that will tweet at me, I can't wait to short Robinhood. So obviously there are some people that are pretty angry still about how this went, but then there are people who look at Robinhood's financials, which showed strong strong revenue growth in spite of all this negativity and they say, you know why I, I'm excited about Robinhood and I believe in this company. So definitely mixed sentiment is what we're hearing and they do have demand within the range. Right. What we're and hearing. a lot of the people who are complaining are still using Robinhood because it is such a simple product. I know some people think it is too simple, but the reality is people are using it. 
Exactly, and if anything, a lot of this negativity probably drove some attention to Robinhood and informed a lot of the world about Robinhood, which is an app that's easy to use and you can trade for free. Certainly, there are some controversies in the way in which they make their money on that they, you know, the payment for order flow, and so some people feel like that's not necessarily a fair practice and that maybe there will be some regulatory concerns there, but um, for now, they've been showing really strong user growth and revenue growth in spite of all these controversies. Okay. All right. Well, we're waiting for that pricing. We'll be following your coverage tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll, of course, be all over the Robinhood IPO as well. Bloomberg's Katie Roof there. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We've got another bumper show tomorrow. T-Mobile CEO Mike Sievert will be here. PacView President Melissa Burdick talking about Amazon's results. And Cisco Executive Vice President Fran Katsudas joining us right here on BTech. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.